Hi, this is Anne Leiden, and today I want to speak about the Son, Jesus Christ, who is the Son of the Heavenly Father. I think it is very difficult to speak about Jesus Christ because we all have different pictures in our minds who the Son is. Who is Jesus Christ? And I tried to find two stories which I would like to share to explain a bit of it. But I think Jesus is so huge, so broad. He's all in all. It is very difficult to describe him. Surely he is love. And he's loving and kind and patient. Before I begin, I want to pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for everything what you are doing. Thank you that we can be here to talk about you, to show a bit of your character, what you have done for us, and what you want to do for us, what you reveal in your word about yourself and the Heavenly Father. I ask you, give us your Holy Spirit to understand what you want us to say and help me to say the right words. Be though our teacher. And this I pray in the almighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the story. <clears throat> the captain of a small steam ship, the story is a bit old. Some years ago, a small steamer was caught in a terrible storm in the South Atlantic. For three days, the ship was tossed by the mighty waves. One mast was knocked off and the steering gear was damaged. Towards the end of the third day, the storm seemed to increase in violence. The sky became darker than ever before. And the poor sailors realized that, that worse times lay ahead. Suddenly, amidst the terrible and fearful thunderclaps, there was a rumor that the ship had sprung a leak. The next moment, all men were at the pumps, but it was soon discovered that the water was rising in the ship faster than they could pump it out. They worked desperately for another hour, but all was in vain. When the captain saw that all was hopeless and that the ship was beyond saving, he ordered the boats, boats to be lowered. To the dismay of all, it was now discovered that only one boat remained unharmed by the waves. The others were so battered that it was impossible they could hold in so rough a sea. There was nothing for it but to crowd the crew into one boat. However, not much place and terrible waves, and this was dangerous. Quickly, the man climbed into the boat and filled it to its utmost carrying capacity. There was just enough room left to squeeze in the captain, who, like the noble sailor he was, had remained behind at the last. He was about to leave the ship and climb down the rope ladder to get into the lifeboat when he heard a sound and looked back. Back on the ship, a stranger came running towards him across the deck. His face was dirty and he was wearing rags. It was a stowaway. How the young man had hidden himself, how he had kept himself alive since the ship left port, the captain did not know and there was no time to inquire. Quick boy, he shouted and went back on board the ship. Down the ladder! The lad needed no more invitations. He left the ship and got into the boat in a moment, filling the last remaining seat. Come here! The man shouted to the captain, willing to overload the boat rather than leave him behind. Cast off! The captain shouted through the holding of the storm. He knew full well that one more in the boat would certainly capsize it and bring death to them all. Terrible decision. But the captain, he went back to the boat and let the young man come into the lifeboat. So the crew pushed off and not a moment too soon. They had scarcely got within a safe distance of the ship before it rolled over on its side and sank in the ocean, carrying the noble captain with it to a watery grave. After many days of hard suffering, the men in the boat were picked up by a passing vessel and eventually 
made it back home. The stowaway never forgot the captain's self-sacrifice. The memory of that heroic death changed his life. He felt he had to earn such a priceless gift. In his pocket, he carried the captain's photograph, which he always showed when he repeated the touching story, saying, he gave his life for me. My friends, can this story help us understand what Jesus has done for each of us? He is the captain. We are the stowaways. We do not in the least deserve to be saved and have a place in his beautiful home. But Jesus died to make this possible. And though it is many, many years since he made this great sacrifice, we can all benefit from it today if we are willing. And just as the blind passenger later spoke of the captain, so we too should be happy to tell others about what Jesus has done for us. We too can say, he died for me. That's really true. Jesus died for you yeah, and my sin. Now I want to go in in some Bible study about the Son, Jesus Christ. God, the eternal Son, became incarnate in Jesus Christ. Through him all things were created. The character of God is revealed. The salvation of humanity is accomplished and the world is judged. Forever truly God, he became also truly human, Jesus the Christ. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He lived and experienced temptation as a human being, but perfectly and exemplified the righteousness and love of God. By his miracles, he manifested God's power and was attested as God's promised Messiah. He suffered and died voluntarily on the cross for our sins and in our place. He was raised from the dead and ascended to heaven to minister in the heavenly sanctuary in our behalf. He will come again in glory for the final deliverance of his people and the restoration of all things. And he will come very soon. He has given everything for us for you and me, that we may come into the heavenly mansions when we are believing in him and doing his will. But we can't earn the eternal life. It is by faith that we can we become partakers of his righteousness. The Son of God, the first Bible verse, Luke 1, 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Christ brought men and women power to overcome. He came to this world in human form to live a man amongst men. He assumed the liabilities of human nature to be proved and right. In his humanity, he was a partaker of the divine nature. In his incarnation, he gained in a new sense the title of the Son of God. From all eternity, Christ was united with the Father. And when he took upon himself human nature, he was still one with God. He is the link that unites God with humanity. Because of the God Father is loving you and me. And this was also to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is also the Word. John, you can read it here in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. And when we are looking on the life of Jesus, we will see he was and is full of grace and truth. The Son. What is he doing? For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. John 5, 22. Christ will declare the reward of loyalty. 
and has given him authority to, to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Christ accepted humanity and lived on this earth a pure, sanctified life. For this reason, he has received the appointment of judge. He who occupies the position of judge is God manifest in the flesh. And we can't have a better judge because he was afflicted as we, he was tempted as we are, and much more tempted as we are in our lives, that he can understand the human weakness and the frailty of our human nature. He sees it. He is looking into our hearts and sees our challenges, our problems, our fights and everything. He is very righteous. I and my father are one. I and my father are one. John 10, 30. As a personal being, God has revealed himself in his son. The outshining of the father's glory and the express image of his person. Jesus as a personal savior came to the world. As a personal savior, savior he ascended on high. As a personal savior, he intercedes in the heavenly courts. Before the throne of God on our behalf, ministers one like unto the Son of Man. They are one, and he is like the Father in character. And he came to the world, and he came up on high again. And he is interceding for us, for our weaknesses, that we may become strength to, um, to be successful in temptations that he can help us in times of need. Christ, the light of the world, wailed the dazzling splendor of his divinity and came to live as a man among men, that they might, without being consumed, become acquainted with their creator. Since sin brought separation between man and his maker, no man has seen God at any time, except as he is manifested through Christ, because we, nobody can see the Father without dying. I and my Father are one, Christ declared. No man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. The Lord can reveal us the Father. He can show himself to see his character, his lovingness, his loving kindness, and his charming love toward all of us. And he shows it to whom he wants to reveal it and ask for it. Jesus. He says in John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, yeah, there you may be also. He is preparing a place for you and me in the heavenly mansions, and he's coming back very soon. Jesus says unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How saith to them, show us the Father. And whatsoever ye ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in it. When we are looking on Jesus, we are seeing the Father and vice versa. And when we are praying after his will, he will see us. He can forgive us our sins. And this he wants to do after first one, one nine. That when we are confessing our sins, we will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sometimes there are some conditions that the Lord can answer our prayer, but we can always pray these promises and try with the help of God to fulfill the conditions. But He is good, He will hear us, He will see our mourning, our yearning after God, after love. Not being alone, but being understood by our dear Lord Jesus Christ. He is looking into, into our heart and he knows your, your wants and your, your 
ability if there's something very difficult to do and he wants to help you with it. That's true, it's really true. The divine authority of Jesus, the world's redeemer was equal with God. His authority was as the authority of God. He declared that he had no existence separate from the Father. The authority by which he spoke and wrought the miracles was expressly his own, yet he assures that he and the Father are one, and he was only doing the will of the Heavenly Father. As legislator, Jesus exercised the authority of God. His commands and decisions were supported by the sovereignty of the eternal throne. The glory of the Father was revealed in the Son. Christ made manifest the character of the Father. He was so perfectly connected with God, so completely embraced in his encircling light that he who had seen the Son had seen the Father. His voice was as the voice of God. They were so, and they are so close together that it is as if one person would speak. But they are two. And Jesus is only doing the will of God, speaking the words and working, working miracles in the name of God the Father. They were so close to God and they are close. The wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A voice heard in heaven. Transgression placed the whole world in geopardy under the death sentence. But in heaven there was a heart, a voice saying, I have found a ransom. Jesus Christ came unto this earth. And what did it do? He lived a life of 100% of obedience to his heavenly father. Therefore, Christ had to die and he was resurrected. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and were in ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in me. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Kephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, present, but some are fallen asleep. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It was foretold that Jesus would die on the cross. You can read it, for example, in Isaiah 53 and I think Psalm 19 or 20, something like this. It was foretold. And he lived a life of 100% obedience to the will of the Father. And he died for your and my sins, that whoever is believing in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. It is free paraphrased by John 3.16. And we can be changed into Jesus' likeness when we are looking unto him. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 3.18. That means we don't need to be as we are now at this moment. It is a progressive uh, development in our Christian life. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. These are the matchless charms of Jesus. Look to Christ, behold the attractive loveliness of his character, and by beholding you will become changed into his likeness. Let's look unto Jesus. I mean, something is too heavy for you and me. We can look on to his cross because he endured so much for us that it won't be so hard for us to endure our cross that we are bearing for him. And meanwhile, looking unto him and we will be more than comforted. 
we are experiencing with sufferings and he will help us see because he has promised it. Beholding Christ. This can be done by reading a really good book, that, as I have mentioned before, The Desires of Ages from Ellen C. White. You can find it on the internet, you can order it somewhere, you will see it when you are looking for it. You can behold him by studying his life, for example, reading and studying these books together with the Bible worship. And we can strive to become Christ-like. Therefore, we are clearing the moral atmosphere. Human peculiarities will disappear, and we will approach the perfect pattern. And Christ will draw his image on the soul. Come close to Jesus. Don't be anxious. He only wants you good things. He is loving you. He's not the bad guy who wants to punish you. When the soul is brought into close relationship with the great author of life and truth, impressions are made upon it, revealing its true position before God. Then self will die, pride will be laid low, and Christ will draw his own image in deeper lines upon the soul. Let's come very close to Jesus. I'm also trying to come closer and closer to him. Try it and beware of Satan's bewitching power. We have to be very careful because the evil one doesn't want this. But this is the eternal weight of glory, coming close to him and becoming more and more like him with his help. It's God, we can't do it by our own. It is by him and by the Holy Spirit who are helping us. Becoming a new creator. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this will happen, you will see. And all things are of God, who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trans trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of rec reconciliation. In another translation, perhaps it's easier to understand, therefore I'm also reading this one. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. This was a new American standard Bible. Grace is not inherited. We can become a new creature, and we will do it when we are coming to Christ and giving our lives into his hands. And there's also another book that I would like to recommend. It is called Steps to Christ. Perhaps it would be good for us to study this one. You will also find it on the internet, which is also from Ellen G. White, a very famous author in the uh, 18, 19th and 20th century. Having Christ's mind. This is what the mind of Jesus is. Let, and we can have the same mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can you imagine he came down to the earth? He was so humble to live a simple life of a simple human being. And he was doing this great offer for us 
that we may live as he died for us. And therefore, God the Father has exalted him over every man, that everybody should bow before him. And he did it. The animals or the people here on earth, everyone, because this is a great sacrifice. And it is adorable. It is really adorable. A perfect photograph of God. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created by Jesus, and that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. We have only one perfect photograph of God, and this is Jesus Christ, who is the creator of all things, who is our Redeemer, who is our Savior who is leading us into eternal life and who soon will come back. And he does not have angelic but human nature. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He, the eternal God, is calling all those who are believing on him brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I and the children which God has given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For war, verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself had suffered, suffered being tempted, he is also able to secure them that are temp tempted. Jesus did live this life of a human being to endure all these temptations without sins, that he can help us when we are tempted to do the wrong thing or to say or think the wrong thing, that we are having a high priest in heaven who is uh, Doing, who is interceding for us that the Lord may give us strength to not give up into temptation, but to resist it. For example, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I will just try to read it. Everybody who is having difficulties, and we do all have difficulties. There has no temptation taken you, but such as it is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. He will make a way of escape because of this. The Lord has made a great sacrifice in order to meet man where he is. He took not on him the nature of angels. He did not come to save angels. It is the seed of Abraham that he is helping. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, Christ said. He helps humanity by taking human nature, and he's bearing us through everything that we are experiencing. Yeah. Jesus, our high priest. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. 
we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And he is there and interceding for us, for you and me, for our life, for the things we have committed. When we are repenting, then he will bring it to the heavenly father and is asking him to forgive us. And he's forgiving. We can rely on it 100% as it was, his word says in 1 John 1, 9, which I told you before. The tabernacle, a type of the Christian church. The Jewish tabernacle was a type of the Christian church. The church on earth, composed of those who are faithful and loyal to God, is the true tabernacle, whereof the Redeemer is the minister, God, and not man, pitched this tabernacle on a high, elevated platform. And in regard to Jesus, this tabernacle is Christ's body, and from north, south, east, and west, he gathers those who shall help to compose it. A holy tabernacle is built up of those who receive Christ as their personal savior. Christ is the minister of the true tabernacle, the high priest of all who believe in him as a personal savior. And he is saving you personally. And he is interested in you personally in all your joys and experiences and sufferings and whatever you may have, what, what is going on with you. He is helping you and he is your personal savior. Praise the Lord. The end, I want to read a story from a very famous man in the English church. Here you can see him as a young preacher in action as New Park Street. It was 15, 15 year old Charles Spurgeon. He was going to church, but every time he was thinking, I don't understand one word of that, what the preacher is talking, I understand it hardly, but something is missing. And it was like as if he had a dark cloud around his mind. Fifteen-year-old Charles Spurgeon was trudging up High Hill in Colchester on his way to church. When the blizzard prevented him from going further, he turned the corner and made his way into a small primitive Methodist church. And it was winter, and there was a snowstorm. <clears throat> now he's... Uh, He's, um, he wrote about it. I am with this his hymn song I read up. I sometimes think I might have been in darkness and despair now had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm one Sunday morning when I was going to a place of worship. When I could not go no further, I turned down the court and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel, there might be a dozen or fifteen people. The minister did not come that morning, snowed up, I suppose. A poor man, a shoemaker, a tailor, or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. He was obli obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had nothing else to say. The text was, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, Isaiah 54, verse 22. He did not even pronounce the words rightly, but that did not matter. And I'm also having difficulty talking. In. There was, I thought, a glimpse of hope for me in the text. He began thus. My dear friend, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. No, that does not take a deal of effort. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It is just Look, well, I mean, a man need not go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, and yet you can look. A man need not be worth a thousand a year to look. Anyone can look. A child can look. But this is what the text says. Look. Look unto me. Then it says, look unto me. Hey, said he in broad Essex. Many of ye are looking to yourselves. No use looking there. You will never find comfort in yourselves. And today there is a lot of selfish people are making, looking unto themselves. But you never will find some comfort in looking unto yourself. 
When the good man followed up his text in this way, look unto me, I am sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me, I am hanging on the cross. Look, I am dead and buried. Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me, I ascend. I am sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, look to me, look to me. When he had got about that length and managed to spin out 10 minutes, he was at the length of his tether sun. Then he looked at me under the gallery and I dare say with so few present, he knew me to be a stranger. He then said, young man, you look very miserable. Well, I did, but I had not been accustomed to have remarks made on my personal appearance from the critic before. However, it was a good blow struck. He continued, and you will always be miserable, miserable in life and miserable in death, if you do not obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment you will be safe. Then he shouted as only a primitive Methodist can, young man, look to Jesus Christ. There, and then the cloud was gone. The darkness had rolled away, and that moment I saw the sun, and I could have risen that moment and sung with the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood of Christ. And Charles Spurgeon became a very famous preacher in England. Jesus is knocking at the door. He says in his word in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Dear friend, do you want to look unto Jesus and want to be saved? It's time now. It's time to give your and my life into Jesus' loving hands that he will care for us and he will show us the way we will go. And there we will be changed into his likeness. Dear friends, give your life into the hand of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for the good work. I thank you for all your loving kindness, for your encouragement, for your help which I have experienced in my life, for the comfort you have given me and will give me when things are difficult especially in these unstable times with possible rumors of wars or wars. I thank you for this. Let us all look unto you. We are miserable and we don't deserve anything. We are coming to you and putting ourselves into your hands. Forgive us our sins and let us think about these things that we personally can come to you and confess them, that you can forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And let's continue looking unto you, the savior of the world, that you may save us, that, you are, that we will walk in your ways and that you will give us the Holy Spirit and lead us your way into all eternity. And you will come back very, very soon. I thank you for everything what you are doing and I will praise you. This I pray in the almighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for listening. Until another time. Bye bye.